Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to Trail Talk. I'm Edie here at the Chisholm Trail Heritage Center. We're in our classroom studio today, and we're going to talk about Oklahoma State Symbols Volume 7. Can you guys believe that we have seven vol volumes and we're not even finished yet? Now, you may notice I'm here by myself today. My partner in crime, Miss Mary, is not available, but I miss her. And Mary, if you're watching, hey, wish you were here. So um, today I kind of did a little um, bit of an alliteration. We're going to talk about the state flower, fish, fossil, and folk song. How about that? I hadn't done one of those yet. So uh, glad to glad to throw that part in for you. Um, so let's get started. Okay, let's go for it. Uh, by the way, thanks for meeting us at the new time, three o'clock. Um, so here we have our Oklahoma state flower, the Oklahoma rose. Now this rose is a hybrid. And if you're not sure what that means, that means that they kind of bred multiple variations or species of roses together to come up with this particular rose. And um, two men, Herbert Swim and O.L. Weeks, are credited with um, putting this beautiful rose together. They worked at Oklahoma State University, probably in the horticulture area. And um, as early as 1963, they thought that they had this. And in 1964, um, it, it came out as um, a rose that um, I, I think when you hear my later description, some would say that um, it's, it's definitely an outstanding um, flower. Uh, there was a woman named Dottie Weisenberger and she became aware of this rose and lobbied for 30 years for this to become our Oklahoma State um, flower. And in 2004, finally, <laughs> it was selected. It's uh, the official name is Rosa, Oklahoma. That's kind of a sciencey kind of word for it. Anyway, it's a dark red rose with a strong, sweet fragrance. And it was the hybrid of the Chrysler Imperial and the Charles Malloran. Both uh, of those roses are from 1952 and 1947. So, um, uh, Actually, I read there are um, roses have been around for like 35 million years, and there are so many different variations of roses. Um, but some of the things that put our Oklahoma rose above and beyond the others are um, just the beautiful dark red, nearly black color. It's it's a double petal. And so that means it's, um, you know, when how when roses open up, sometimes they're they're just full of those petals, and that's what this one would look like whenever they fully open. Um, and uh, there are there are literally hundreds of species, and they come in all different colors: red, pink, white, yellow. Um, and you know the the smell. Um, I, if I say something about roses, roses perfume from Avon. <laughs> You're going to know exactly what I'm talking about if you are of a certain age and older. And to me, that perfume always smelled so much like a real rose. And there's just something just so, um, I don't know, just the, the smell associated with the flower. And, you know, roses have been used as, I don't know, there have been songs and poems. They're used in... Um, mythology and fairy tales. I mean, there are so many places that people use this flower. Um, you know, one one thing the the thorns on the stems and but you know what it's like to give someone a bouquet of roses or to receive a bouquet of roses. It just it means a lot. And um, so roses are you know, really people who love them really think that they're a beautiful flower. Um, you know, roses are not just for the, um, the person who likes to look at them or smell them. They have been used for medicinal purposes for a long, long time. 
um, they especially the petals and then the rose hips, which is um, the little fruit that's at the base here after the flower fades. There's the little rose hip there and birds uh, will eat those as well. Um, but yeah, you know, rose hip, I think there's probably like an essential oil or the actual rose hip. There's probably some kind of vitamin C. A, a vitamin. It's full of vitamin C. Oh, it's a source of my uh, off camera assistant today. <laughs> Scott is telling me rose hips are full of vitamin C. And I, I know I've seen like tablets or things like that, that you can take that are rose hips. So um, there's, a, you know, roses, roses are a very important plant. Um, but the thing about these, uh, they are also not, not this particular species, not the Oklahoma rose, but roses are our national flower. And in addition to having a state flower, remember that Oklahoma also has a floral emblem, which is the mistletoe, you're right, and a state wildflower, the, oh, you got it right again, the Indian blanket. So we have a lot of flowers here that um, really um, we feel like resonate with the people of Oklahoma, not to mention our cool state rock that looks like a rose. It's called a rose rock. So roses, um, you know, they're, they're just kind of all throughout uh, Oklahoma. Roses grow well here. You know, I've had rose bushes. Um, they didn't live that long under my care, but they had been there for a long time before I became responsible for them. But anyway, roses grow well here in Oklahoma too. And a fun thing to do at the state fair is to walk through where the, they have the competition of the rose growing. And there's always a lot of really beautiful roses there. But Oklahoma's state flower, the Oklahoma rose. All right, the next F is our state fish, the white bass. It's also known as the sand bass and the silver bass. Sand bass, I think is what I would normally refer to this fish as, but the white bass is the official name used as our state fish. Um, it was adopted in 1974 as our state fish. And um, according to the Oklahoma Wildlife Conservation, Department of Wildlife Conservation, white bass are native to Oklahoma and survive on a diet of minnows, shad, crustaceans, and insects. So that's important stuff to know when you're out bass fishing, right, people? So um, they are freshwater fish, which stands to reason since practically every body, I think maybe every single body of water in Oklahoma is a fresh water place. Um, so it's silvery white and then has green on it, as you can tell from this picture, um, with dark, these little dark stripes that run along the body. Um, two dorsal fins, one is much more prickly than the other. So you know what that's like when you're fishing, you have to really watch out for that. Um, the body is deep and compressed. So it's, it's pretty long, about 10 to 12 inches is a typical size but it's very compressed means like if you look at it head on, if they're very thin, they are, their bodies are not very big. Uh, thick, I guess, would be a good way to describe that. Um, there has been, they, there have been bass, white bass in caught that were 17 inches long, which how fun would that be? I mean, a 10 or 12 incher is fun to haul in, but a 17 incher, the largest one, because they're not just, they're native to Oklahoma, but they're not just in Oklahoma. The largest was caught in 1989 in Virginia. It weighed six pounds and 13 ounces. Now that is some bass right there. I don't know if they released it. You know, I think there's like a big Bertha or something at like a uh, oh, what are those uh, fishing stores? Those Bass Pro Shop. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> I couldn't think of that. Bass Pro Shop, had, they have had like this big old bass in there. I've seen it named Big Bertha. And Big Bertha was big. Now, I don't know how much she weighed, but anyway, so these guys are carnivores. You can tell from the crustaceans and minnows and all that that I've mentioned earlier. 
they're visual feeders. So that means, you know, they see something and then they'll go after it to eat it. And if they're, if they're not frightened, they will bite live bait like minnows and worms. So if you're gonna go fishing, I'm gonna give you some fishing tips, hot catch your bass tips because they are about to start spawning and they'll start right now, the water's the right temperature. I'll tell you what those temp that temperature is in a minute through May. So it's a good time to go out and maybe try to catch some. Um, but if you're gonna use live bait, then you need to put it on like about a 12 inch leader off the end of your line. And you probably wanna be fishing from a boat to do this um, so that the bait can just kind of hang down there. That way, if they see it, they'll hit it. And you'll, you know, this, the leader would be attached with a swivel with a little weight up there. Um, so uh, the, it's important though, these fish reproduce at unbelievable numbers. I mean, one female may lay as many as a million eggs at one time. Now, obviously they're not all going to hatch, but um, they lay them and then they, uh, the eggs attach to different things in the water, logs or leaves or whatever is around there. So they're, they're laying these eggs in shallow water. Um, and then they, they will hatch out one time a year is when they do that. But I mean, there's no limit. These, bat, these fish are not um, endangered or on any kind of watch list because they can reproduce so easily and so rapidly. But it is important for them to not, there not be too many. This is a great reason to go fishing. <laughs> you don't want too many in, your, in the body of water because they need to be able to eat enough in the springtime to get enough fat or lipids on their body to be able to withstand a cold winter when there won't be as much um, little things for them to eat. But you know, people aren't gonna go throw minnows and worms in the water to try to catch them in the winter time either. So they're, they're in large reservoirs and rivers. You know, you can put some in your pond and play if you have a large enough pond. Um, and it's interesting mentioning about the reservoirs. So they are native to Oklahoma, but they were not found in great numbers until the reservoirs were constructed. So side note, if you're not aware of this, there are no natural lakes in Oklahoma. They're all man-made reservoirs. And there are over a hundred of those in our lake. And I looked to see, they, they began building them around 1930 and all the way to about 1970. And so um, during that 40 year time, Oklahoma added a lot of lakes to our, um, I guess our, our landscape. And even though it seemed like maybe the reason to do that was because, you know, the Dust Bowl happened in the thirties. And so it didn't seem like there was enough water, but in reality, the rivers, because of the fluctuation of drought and heavy rains, the rivers would overflow. And so by building these reservoirs, it was really a, a kind of a ecological th good thing to do because it helps keep these rivers from overflowing. There are places for the water to be held. And so anyway, um, a great thing that Robert S. Kerr and Carl Albert did were in, in conjunction with each other kind of made all that happen in our state. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, they are spawning right now. The ideal or optimal water temperature is 58, 54 to 68 degrees. So that's a little chilly for me, but these fish like it right then, like at that temperature. And so they're going to be spawning. They spawn during the day. Um, one other thing that you can, uh, there, they, this points out something, this um, arched back. That is something that this particular bass has that is unique um, compared to other bass. The others, it doesn't arch up quite as bad, big right there. They have one round or heart-shaped patch uh, on their tongue. And this said that they only have one tongue patch. I really don't know what a tongue patch is on a fish. I'm not at all sure. Maybe if some of you viewers know, you could send me a message and tell me because I'd like to know. They also are in large schools. And 
if you're wanting to go catch some bass in the summertime when the shad, you know, shad are like small little bait fish that you put on trot lines, things like that. Um, when those are running and it looks like the water's boiling, um, you can throw, you can catch shad, but you can also catch bass who might be in there feeding on those shad. So that's a good thing to know. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's no limit. The way the information um, I found stated that is that there's no creel limit, C-R-E-E-L. So if you don't know what creel is, it's um, like a basket, you know, that you would keep your fish in when you catch them, a creel basket. So basically what's that say, what that's saying is that there's no creel limit, there's no catch limit on white bass. So that's a, that's a really um, good thing to know. So here are some additional fishing tips. Um, a lipless crankbaits in gold, silver, or red, sassy shad in pearl white, shallow or medium diving, lipped crankbaits in shad color variations, and small white marabou jigs and curly tail grubs. Go stock your tackle box now and go get ready to catch some of these fish. Um, if you're using an artificial lure like the ones I just described, be sure you have a slow, steady, you know, you're just kind of cranking and pulling and keep it slow and steady because you don't want to frighten the fish. You just need to get their attention and they'll do all the work. Um, okay, so that's, that's all the information about the white bass, the sand bass. I have never heard of a silver bass, but they do say that that's a, another name that they are um, known by. So Oklahoma State fish, the white bass. Now we're going to talk about our fossil. And I'm going to do my best to say it. I might say it one or two other times, but I'm not going to repeat this a lot. So it's a Serophagonix maximus. And you all can probably guess this means big, really, really big. Um, this guy was named our state fossil in 2000, and it was a huge predatory dinosaur, larger, most people would agree, actually larger than a T-Rex, although you can tell it has a longer neck and it, it has these shorter front legs, but not as short as a T-Rex. Um, so it's really an Allosaurus, it's not the Tyrannosaurus. So it's a, a creature that has a longer neck. Um, they believe it's breaking it down. They call it king, the greatest king of reptile eaters. Uh, well, the bill that named it as our state fossils called it this, the greatest king of reptile eaters. It's also called Lord of lizard eaters. So um, this guy, <laughs> Uh, kind of, uh, I'm going to say controlled most of the area. And they actually found fossils from this animal in Oklahoma. Um, so in 1931 and 32, a man named John Willis Stovall uncovered the remains of this, they called it a theropod, uh, near Kenton. K-E-N-T-O-N in Cimarron County. Um, and in 1941, he named it the Serophagus Maximus and then through different, for different reasons, you know, not in the forties, information was not as available as it is today. So that name had already been given to another fossil from a, that was found somewhere else around the world and he just didn't know it. But it means basically lizard eater at the largest. Um, and then later it was changed um, in, let's see, in 1995, he added uh, a, a man named uh, Daniel Schur, uh added the Greek suffix A-N-A-X, which meant ruler. So it was a lizard eater of the greatest size and then ruler was added to its name. And there's a large skeleton this probably is the picture of that skeleton. That it's at the Sam Noble Museum, uh, Oklahoma Museum of Natural History, which is in Norman, Oklahoma, just right 
it may even be on the OU campus. It's right there at the campus. Um, there was a partial skeleton found in New Mexico, but this is this is where uh, Oklahoma is where the majority of this guy was found. Um, they believe that it was probably about 46 feet in length, which is very, very big. I mean, I don't know, that just blows my mind. Um, but it, and of course it was a carnivore. We can definitely tell by its teeth here, long, sharp teeth for ripping and de devouring meat, put it in bite-sized pieces and probably swallowed it whole. I don't really see any flat or chewing teeth. So they just probably swallowed whatever they grabbed, shredded it a little bit. And boom, took it right down, <laughs> gulped it down. There's a lot of cool information about our state fossil out there. I mean, I didn't even know, I didn't know anything about this dinosaur until I was um, studying this information. So um, it's it's got a lot of great historical um, significance to it. And the fact that it was here in Oklahoma, I'm sure that for people who study all of those things, that it's a pretty important piece of history that they found. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to talk about our folk song. But before I get to the song itself, I want to introduce you to Woody Guthrie. He is the man who wrote and composed our state song, Oklahoma Hills. Now, um, Woody Guthrie was named, he was born, uh, let me find this, in July, let me find it, July 14th, 1912 in Okima, Oklahoma. His full name is Woodrow Wilson Guthrie. He went by Woody. He, there were five kids in his family. He was the third. And um, he wrote two autobiograph autobiographical novels, numerous essays and articles, more than 1,000 songs and poems, and hundreds of letters. He drew more than 500 illustrations, recorded hundreds of songs, and was a major influence in the urban folk revival. So to say that Woody Guthrie contributed to our nation um, as far as musically and in a literary sense is an understatement. He just, from what I read about him, it sounded like writing music, writing, just putting words on paper, uh, lyrics, poems, essays, whatever, that just brought him so much joy. And he was just so natural um, at, at doing that, that it was, he, he had an education, um, but just to be able to write all of those things, I mean, that's so much to produce. And especially he was 55 years old when he died. So it was a pretty young man. Um, and to produce all of those things in that short period of time is quite astounding. So his father um, came to Indian Territory from Texas working as a cowboy. His mother, um, her family were school teachers and she came from Kansas. And um, Woody Guthrie heard his father sing cowboy songs and his mother played the piano as he was growing up. So that was a lot of inspiration for him. Um, then when he, be, he turned six, his family really went, started going through some tough times. His mom, um, well, they believe today that she had Huntington's disease, but in those days, they assumed that she was losing her sanity. And she ended up being placed in a mental hospital and, and she actually died there. Um, his father, not sure you know, what to do. They had, they had accumulated a very nice life and a lot of things, but all that kind of ended up going away. Um, his sister was in some kind of an accident and burned so badly that she died. And his father also was burned seriously and ended up having to go live with relatives to help care for him. And all these things are happening between like the ages of six and 15 for Woody. And those are very formative years. And um, once his father went to live with relatives in Pampa, Texas, Woody actually stayed in Okima. He went to school, he would live with different families, people would let him stay. 
and he did odd jobs, whatever he could. In the summers, he'd go to Pampa and visit his father. He ended up moving there his, for his senior year of high school um, when he was 17. Um, he um, later be, you know, became known as the Oklahoma Dust Bowl balladeer, ballad singer, I guess would be another word to say that. But he experienced the Dust Bowl years in Pampa, Texas, which would have been equal to being here in Oklahoma. I mean, Pampa's flat, dusty, little shrub trees, nothing really big. So I'm sure it was just as horrific there as it was here. Um, but in Pampa, he learned to play the guitar, the fiddle, the banjo, and the mandolin, and did some interesting work, worked for a bootlegger, painted signs, but mostly played at dances and entertained people. Um, his desire to be a country Western entertainer drove him to California and uh, he had married and he and his wife got there a few months before his second daughter was born in July of 1937. So he moved, moves out to California, um, kind of, I don't know if it was actually Grapes of Wrath style, but it was during that time period when people were leaving Oklahoma and going West, just looking for a life that wasn't so meager and almost hopeless. I mean, it was, those were very difficult days here in our state. So um, Woody ended up in the Los Angeles area, he had a cousin named Jack and they started performing together. Uh, they were on a radio show and then his cousin left and uh, Woody paired up with a lady named Maxine Lefty Lou Chrisman and they had thousands of fans um, who would listen to them on the radio. And during that time, he wrote a lot of songs, including Oklahoma Hills. Um, in March of 1940, Guthrie recorded songs for the Library of Congress, making him a, uh, a central figure of our nation during those days. That, that shows you the impact he was having on our country as a whole and something that people at the Library of Congress felt that that would be important for him to do would be to record his music for them. Um, and uh, then he went to New York and recorded songs for RCA Victor, ended up in Portland, Oregon, where he wrote 28 songs in 28 days. That has like quotation marks around it. So I don't know if that's a little bit of a stretch, but um, in the forties, he wrote, so long, it's been good to know you, bound for glory, and the one everyone knows, this land is your land. He joined the mer Merchant Marines during World War II, and on uh, the day Germany surrendered, he was drafted into the U.S. Army. And then in 1944, he started recording, and during the next six years, he recorded approximately 200 sides, possibly more, all his own songs and then also traditional and country songs. And I think sides is referring to like the two sides of a record. Um, so that was, that's a lot. He was, it sounds like he was in there working all the time. Well, in 1950, he began showing the symptoms of Huntington's disease, the disease they now believe took his mother's life. And it also, caused the disintegration of his family. Um, he, uh, his songs weren't only songs that people learned and, and sang along, but they, it was kind of like a documentary. He was documenting the things that were happening in our country. So it was like historical information basically was what he was writing. He was just setting it to music which is, I mean, what a brilliant way to hold history, right? To write lyrics and put it to music and then people sing it and hang on to history like that. I think that's a, what a great contribution from Woody Guthrie. Um, he had a great command of the English language, but just like Will Rogers, he chose to use um, poor grammar and kind of role play. He was always, I think, kind of the class clown. He could juggle and do things like that. And so he was always an entertainer. Um, he died October 3rd, 1967. And after that time, tributes began 
really pouring in. Um, he, in 77, he was posthumously inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Association Hall of Fame, 1988 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, in 2000, the Recording Industry Association of America named This Land is Your Land as the third most important song written in the 20th century. Wow, what, what an accolade that is. Um, and Friends of the Libraries of Oklahoma partnered with the same organization for in with USA and Literary Landmark Program and named Okima as Oklahoma's first recipient of the Literary Landmark Honor as a tribute to the literary achievements of their favorite native son, Woody Guthrie. And um, so this next slide, I, I put the words to the um, chorus of Oklahoma Hills. Um, and you can see, I mean, he uses the Indian nation, ride the ride my pony on the reservation. Those are all historical, that's historical information. He also mentions a cowboy's life and um, the Oklahoma Hills. And so we're gonna play a little bit of this song. So if, in case you're not familiar with it. Month has come and gone since I've wandered from my home. Knows Oklahoma Hills where I was born. Many a page my past turned, many a lesson I have learned, and I feel like in those hills where I belong. Way down yonder on the Indian Nation, ride my pony on the reservation in the Oklahoma Hills where I was born. Okay, so um, that that particular clip of that song is actually Arlo Guthrie, Woody's son, who went on to um, become a known recording artist himself. Um, but it's from a movie called Hard Traveling that's about the life of Woody Guthrie. And uh, so I'm not only telling you today about our, uh, our state's folk song, but also about the man who uh, wrote that song as well as thousands of others and um, how proud we are to say that he is from Oklahoma as well. So there you have it, folks. The uh, volume seven of Oklahoma State Symbols, our flower, fish, fossil, and folk song. I hope you've learned a lot and had a great time today on Trail Talk. I certainly have. Please join me tomorrow at 3 p.m. when Christy King from the Stevens County Genealogy Library it will join us to talk about genealogy and the location here in Duncan and how you can uh, find out more about your family's history. So be sure and join us here on Trail Talk then. And until next time, Happy trails. Happy trails. Bye.